All right, well, hey, it is time to get started and uh, welcome. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Abraham Sion. I'm one of the founders of the Government Contractors Association. So it's good to have everybody here. Now, this should be a pack room. Last week we had an event here. We had about 95 people here. Uh, today, this is like one of the most important practical things you got to do to get in the government market. We have a few people online and a few people in the classroom. So people don't want to win contract. They, they come. There's the dog and pony show, right? Last week was the dog and pony show. Today is like the meat and potato. And this is the practical stuff that you need to know. And we have a few people show up. So I'm, I'm a little surprised by that there. So uh, maybe people have figured it out already and they just want to do the dog and pony show a little bit. <laughs> the dog and pony show is good because that's networking and that's you know connecting and you know, it's more fun, but this is the grunt work. This is where things get done. So this class, we call this here our deep dive Wednesday sessions because we dive deep and we go into the details of things. So for those of you who are joining us online, for those of you who are here in the classroom, I'm proud of you for making it out. And uh, I know traffic was bad today. Traffic was heavy, but it's good to have everybody here. Uh, let me uh, make sure everything is showing up correctly. Let me hide this stuff here and uh, we will get started. All right. So this session is being recorded. We record all of our sessions for future purposes. If you are a member, you can take advantage of all the other sessions that you did miss. You can uh, go and watch it in our govtrainingvault.com. And as a member, you have free access to that. For non-members, it's like $39 a month. So it's Obviously, it makes sense to be a member because you get so many other benefits. Um, but let's start with this here. Before I go into myself, go into the whole uh, session today, I want to kind of see who's in the audience. And this opportunity to kind of share them about yourself, uh, something unique about you. And then it gives the other, other people in the classroom to kind of get to know you a little bit also for after, after today, you get your chance to network as well of, this, of the session here. So. Why don't we start over here? So tell us who you are, your business, and something unique, like a secret thing that you have that no one knows, and we're gonna be best buddy here, so <laughs> you want us to know. <laughs> oh, so this is the circle of trust. Yeah, this is the circle of trust. My name is Paula Harding. I mean, I'm a company executive specialist. I've been in construction for 19 years. I'm a Native American Indian woman. I'm a certified um, Indian Indian. I participate in the finishing side of construction projects, whether it's commercial or residential. And something that no one knows about me. Um, Just something unique. It doesn't have to be no one knows, but something. I, mean, I, mean, I eat 10 to 15 Oreos and cookies each night. Oh, wow. <laughs> I hate no one <laughs> 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 Oh, wow. I'm naughty. Well, hey, I'm going to have lunch. I'm going to eat that for lunch today. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, well, thank you for sharing a little about yourself here. All right. Up next. Mm -hmm. And I am on the construction side. And my business is, as you know, we're able to turn the old frame door to have the same attributes as the steel frame door. And something that you don't uh, know about me, I do not eat cookies because I'm still fat. <laughs> <laughs> and I did have an ice cream, I'm still fat. Uh, Deborah, you look awesome. I don't know what you're talking about, but you look awesome. So, <laughs> All right, next. My name is Shanika Rodriguez. organizational and business process transformation. Uh, and a secret about me is I have zip lines across Lake Lanier. Oh, wow. I never do again. <laughs> wow. At least it's not a valley. It's a it's water underneath, <laughs> right? Did you tell her it's a cookie factory? I don't know. <laughs> 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 it's a wine. <laughs> so, so next time, do the wine before you. <laughs> All right. Nice. Hey, uh, my name is Chris Lewis. Um, I own and operate um, Robert Wood Central Advisors, and I represent business owners, 
members that are in the market looking for commercial real estate space, whether it's on the office or the industrial side. And so found this by the CC Opportunity Network to learn more about how to you know, go to the business. But something um, about me, I'm a former Army officer and I'm still serving the reserve. All right, well, thank you for your service. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help it. All right, and ma'am? Okay, well, I'm upgrading from Oreos to Parisians. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you guys do natural juices and Caribbean food. Okay, like what type of Caribbean food? We do like jerk chicken, jerk chicken, and Okay, you have me at jerk chicken, so. You know, uh, last week I went fishing on the Chattahoochee River and I was craving oxtail. No so, way. so when I got out of the river, I took out my app and I said, hey, you know, where is the nearest Caribbean restaurant? I got to give you some oxtail. So, yeah, I, I love oxtail um, and curry goat and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love jerk chicken. I love all of it. So, so you guys have a catering business or you have a restaurant also? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, uh, yeah, that that's great. So good stuff there. Um, there's more things I want to talk. About. I want to comment on all your businesses, but we would go away from today's class. Uh, but I'll comment a little bit as we go through um, and tie it back to your industry as well. All right, sir. Your name, your business, and something unique about yourself. Awesome. <laughs> All right, I think we have a few people join us online since we do have a few minutes. Uh, let me uh, I'm going to give uh, Alex, uh, I'm turning on your mic. You want to share a little about yourself, your business, and something unique about you? Oh, wow. Um, okay. Um, first of all, when you walk away from the mic, I, it's very difficult to hear anything that's going on, but uh, I'll try and follow along as best I can. My name is Alex Walker. I'm the Director of Operations for a company named KAG1. We are a service disabled veteran owned company. Nothing really, we're, we're, we're ordinary people just trying to create and develop an extraordinary business where we provide supply chain management resources, tools, and et cetera to federal, state, local government, as well as B2B companies, B2B business opportunities. Okay, awesome. And something unique about you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Nothing really unique about me. I, I guess um, I've, I've hit my, my middle age stride and I'm in the best shape I've ever been in my life, which is pretty awesome. But I'm sore than I've ever been <laughs> as well. Sure. But I'll take the soreness for good health. Awesome. Awesome. And you do that through eating Oreos also? Uh, occasionally, unfortunately. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thanks for joining us, Alex. All right. And then we have our last person online, uh, Cheryl Clark. Uh, you have to un unmute your mic. If you don't do it in the next two seconds, then we're going to move on. So if you can hear me, unmute your mic and share a little bit about you, your business, and something unique about you. Uh, you're on Jeopardy. Uh, time countdown here. 
All right, so uh, no, no, uh, no feedback from Cheryl, but uh, go ahead and continue uh, listening in, and uh, we will continue with the show here as well. All right, so uh, I'll stay close to the mic, Alex, so you can hear me, uh, so that uh, you know, even though you're online, I definitely want you to get the most out of this presentation as well. So today we're going to be talking about the government fiscal year, and uh, we're going to look at the federal market, the local, we're going to look at all the different fiscal year, business fiscal year as well. And, but more importantly, how to take advantage of the government fiscal year. Because you can understand it, but if you don't understand how and when to do what part of it, when's the best time to market? When's the best time to make a phone call? When's the best time to write a proposal? You know, that's what we'll be talking about today. But to do that, I want to share a little bit about myself. And some of you, you know, have heard my story, so I'm not going to go into a lengthy part of it. But uh, I'm an entrepreneur, like most of you. Uh, that's kind of my background. And so I've taken all my years of entrepreneurship and do that through being a small business advocate, helping the small business grow in the government market. My uh, first startup was a baseball card comic book shop. And any, you know, some of you remember back in the 90s how Facebook car was all the, the, the craze, right? Uh, and so I, uh, someone I met, he said, hey, I'm starting up a baseball card and I need a partner to help me run this and grow this here. And so I was a young, you know, you know, 19, 20 years old. And he said, you know, let's do this here. So I got into the business with him. We started, we had a few boxes of baseball cards and we grew that little business into millions and millions of baseball cards. So it was a lot of fun. Then uh, I decided I want to be a missionary and a humanitarian for the rest of my life. So I sold everything I had. I went overseas to become a missionary, went to Thailand. I'm from Laos originally, went to Thailand with the hopes of going back to Laos uh, to live out the rest of my years there. Well, obviously that didn't work out. Laos was a communist country. They wouldn't let me in. They thought, why do you want to come back to Laos? I said, this is my home. You know, this is, this is my people. This is my country. Uh, they said, you know, we have nothing to offer you. And, uh, and that's where I was born, right? That's my home. And for your, do I still have family there? Uh, yeah, cousins, uh, not immediate family, but, you know, second, third cousins and so forth. Uh, and so they would let me in. So I thought, well, if I can't go back to Laos, Thailand is awesome because the, the Thai language and the, the, the Lao language is kind of like American English and Australian English. They're, you know, they're, you know, very similar. You can understand about 95% of everything. Um, kind of, yes. There's a lot of cultural differences and there's a lot of innuendos and a lot of other things that may be different, but. And so I couldn't go back to Laos, decided to come back to the U.S., got back to the U.S. and thought, okay, what am I going to do? I went to work at Motorola. And anybody still with Corporate America? All of you guys are in full-blown business. And all right, good. That's awesome. Because you know how sometimes you have to do one foot in and one foot out until you can really grow your business? So you guys have transitioned to being a full-time entrepreneur, which is great. So at that time, I was working at Motorola. And I thought corporate America is awesome for other people. And you guys realize that. That's why you're here, right? And, and some people thrive in corporate America. They, they love the corporate ladder. And they, they, their, their goal is I want to get a nice corner office. And one day, you know, I want to be a CEO of this company. And that's their dream. And, and some people were, are designed to be like that. And, and so there's, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's any bad thing about that. That just means that that's how they are. That's how they thrive. And some people thrive in that. And some people suffocate in corporate America. Uh, most people suffocate in corporate America, but they don't have, uh, they don't feel like they have an option, right? Maybe life has gotten too complex and they need that steady <coughs> every single day, <coughs> single week. Uh, and so, so maybe some people feel like they don't have an option. And that's what they did. Yeah. Um, let me see. I think that's uh, somebody is. Okay. All right. Someone's coughing online, but I, I muted that person there. So. so yeah. <laughs> 
So I decided, okay, you know what? Uh, let me go out there and start another business. So I had $300 to my name. Uh, I decided to start up an office furniture company. And people said, how are you going to start up an office furniture company? Like this table that you're sitting on, this table is about 200 bucks. So how do you start an office furniture business with 200 bucks, with 300 bucks? I can buy two of these there. How am I going to do that, right? And people say, how do you do that? And I said, business is not about money. What is business about? Credit, yeah. And demand. Supply and demand, yes. Creating opportunity, relationships. Yes, it's, there's more be, beyond business than just money. It's all the other things, right? Uh, but more importantly, if you understand supply and demand, you understand relationships, you, you understand how to create opportunities. So I thought business is, I want to find some people with problems, and I know there's other people with solutions, and I'm just going to connect the two. So it's really just about people. We're in the people business. And finding people with problems and finding pe people with solutions, until you create your own solutions, you just become a problem solver. And that's really what business is about, just solving problems. So I took $300, and I remember back then, uh, pages, right? Some of you guys remember the yellow pages days before there was you know, a smartphone, and you can just Google anything. In fact, Google is listening to you 24-7. If, if you're talking about something, office furniture, and you turn on the phone, and office furniture automatically just loads up for you, right? <laughs> We're in those days now. But back then... I thought, okay, let me find somebody with a problem. So I called a few people and they said, yeah, I need some furniture. And then I said, okay, let me go to the office furniture section and let me find somebody who has the right furniture for them. And I went, this guy named, you always remember your first dollar, right? Your first client, your first dollar. Most of us remember that. Now, if you didn't, because that's because you're, you're just awesome and you got so much money, you don't remember your first kill. But you're... <laughs> Your first kill, most of us remember our first dollar, and some of us, we frame our first dollar and so forth. And, and so I called this guy up. His name is Bradley. He's with a company called Architecture Installation of a Land. And your first deal, you just kind of remember. It's like your first boyfriend, right? Your first girlfriend. Whether it's a good experience, bad experience, you remember that. So Bradley said, yeah, you know what? I got furniture in here that I just need to get rid of. And it's just taking up warehouse space. I said, okay. So I went and met with him, and I called up the guy and said, hey, is this the right furniture for you? And the guy said, yes. He ended up buying $4,000 worth of furniture, but I made $500 brokering the deal. So I thought, okay, I can do furniture, right? And so I started doing furniture, grew that business with from $300. I remember in my first warehouse, it was a 10 by 10 uh, storage unit. I, you know, you can't get a real warehouse, but I can get a... 10 by 10 storage unit. So that was my first warehouse. After six months, I had 75 storage units. I have flipped that furniture over and over, flipped the $300 over and over and over and over. I had 75 storage. Then I got tractor trailers. Then I got, uh, I said, I need a real warehouse. I went and got a 10,000 square foot uh, warehouse. Grew that business from $300 to $10 million worth of inventory of furniture in about five years. Then I decided to sell that business and uh, get into real estate, start investing in real estate uh, and flipping properties and building communities. And then the real estate market crashed in 2007. Anybody impacted by that? Were you in real estate back in 2000? Oh, okay, so you missed that cycle. Uh, well, we're at here and we're about to hit another cycle, so. <laughs> yes, uh, but if you understand things goes in cycle, you prepare for it. Uh, it's hard when you're in the middle of it and you, you fail to prepare for it. But something like the Great Recession, it took out so many people. And we were in that. You know, we, we, we had a mortgage company, a real estate company, investment company, a construction company, all of it tied to real estate. And it was really devastating during that time there. But learn a lot from it. But in that there, I discovered government contracting. And so I met a gentleman, Lieutenant Colonel, retired from the Army. And he said, Abe, I, you know, I'm 22 years in, you know, 11 of those years, I was a procurement contracting officer. I've awarded over $5 billion in government contracts. And I'm going to help businesses go to the government market. But he didn't, he wasn't an entrepreneur. He didn't understand business. He understood procurement and policies and processing from the other side. 
but he didn't understand your how you struggle to get there. So he said, we should do something together. So that's kind of how I got to the government space, fell in love with the government market. But as a consulting organization, we charge a lot of money. If a business like Claudette, if you don't have a hundred thousand dollars, you couldn't afford our services. Because consulting, we charge a lot of money. And, and so we can only help medium and large size companies. And I thought, how do I help the small businesses? And I look at, look at it this way here. The ladies in the room, you represent almost 51% of the population. But when it comes to government contracting, you're winning less than 5% of contracting dollars. What do you think about that? It's an opportunity that is absolutely. And I thought there's a huge opportunity. Why is it that women businesses are not breaking, able to break into the government market? And I thought, who's going to help them? And at first I thought, you know, you look at yourself in the mirror and you, and you think it's somebody else, but that person in the mirror keeps looking back at you and say, Hey, maybe you're that person to do something about it. And then I look at veteran owned businesses, veterans represent seven to 8% of the community. They put their lives on the line. They go out and serve us, but then they want to become entrepreneurs and they're getting less than 3% of contracting dollars. I thought, who's going to help them? And I look at minority owned businesses. Minority represent 35% of the community, but through the 8A program are getting about 5% of contracting dollars. I thought, okay, someone's got to do something about this. So I decided to leave consulting, start the Government Contractors Association. That's kind of how GCA got here. So that's what we do here. We, we're, we support the small business community. Uh, I get to be part of your story. And um, I'll share one quick story. I met a, gentleman, uh, a young lady, 69 years old, and she's a retired educator. Her name is Barbara Culp, and she wanted to be an entrepreneur. But as an educator, she's never really fully understand the principles of entrepreneurship. Because education is go get a good education, get a good job, and retire, right? And she said, I've lived that life, but I'm still, I still have other things I want to do. I want to be an entrepreneur. She says, hey, can you help me build a business and start a business and build a business and get government contracts? So I started working with her, and it's so amazing. She, got, she went from not having a company to starting a business, getting a website, everything from the ground up, and now she's won multiple government contracts. And in part of what we do here is we get to do that. We get to be part of your journey as you embark in the government market and the greatest reward for us is to see you start, have a starting point and seeing you continue to grow in the government space. So since we've been doing this, we've helped businesses get about $900 million in government contracts. It's been an incredible journey. Our goal is to help some of you in the room and online to get to a billion. And we want to be part of that journey. We want you to be part of that journey with us. So that's a little bit about me. So now let's talk about you, right? What you're going to get out of today. We're going to talk about the government fiscal year from the state, local, and uh, 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 federal market as well. Uh, anybody know what SLED means? S-L-E-D. So you're going to be learning governance today. I'm going to teach you different things. Uh, any, anybody know what SLED? S-L-E-D. So, there, so from a, the contracting world, there's the federal market, and then everything outside of that is SLED. SLED stands for state, local, and education. So that's how the, in the government world, that's how they categorize the federal and then SLED. So we're gonna be talking about those different uh, fiscal year. Then we're talking about when is the best time to market? When is the best time to build relationship and sell in the government market. And then we're talking about when are KO and COs most receptive to hear from you? What does CO stand for? Contract officer. Contract officer. But in the military, it stands for? No, commanding officer. What is it, Chris? CO in the military stands for? Commanding officer. Oh, that's what I didn't hear you. So yes, commanding officer. Yes. So in the contracting world, DOD spends about 
55 to 60 percent of all federal spending. So you're going to hear the term KO more often than the word CO as well. Contracting officer. And they spell with a K. They because CO synonymous with commanding officer. So we don't use CO. Most agents CO they means contracting officer. But because military is so huge, uh, we use the word KO also. It stands for contracting officer. Yep. So we're going to look at when are they most receptive to hear from you. We're going to look at the 10 steps that agencies go through to buy from you also. And we're going to look at 12 steps that you go through to engage them as well. So that's, you know, ultimately we're going to look at how to take advantage of this fiscal year. And uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at. And then if you want a copy of this, uh, presentation here, you can go to govassociation.org forward slash download. So feel free to take all the notes you want, but you can download a copy of today's presentation by going to that link there. And uh, in fact, we have other presentations there as well. So any questions before we get started? Or comments? All right. So let's dive in. So the fiscal year. What is a fiscal year? How, how would you define fiscal year? Anybody? Okay, what is it? Okay, the period of time where you spend money. Okay. It's the accounting year. <laughs> yes, they, yeah, they have their Christmas different time than we do. So yeah, that's a good way to look at it. All right, Chris, you have comments? Okay, it's any 12 month period and it does not necessarily start in January. Okay, that's good. So it is the period used by government for accounting and budget purposes. So that's a, that's a short definition of it. And it's their financial year. So it's the financial year. The fiscal year is the financial year. It's not necessarily the calendar year or it could be the calendar year, but it doesn't have to be. And it's also the budget year. So it's their budget year. And the budget year can be any that they choose. And we're going to look at examples of how different agencies choose different things. And we'll look at businesses and why you choose certain fiscal year as well. But why you should care is this here. This is you. You have a sales process and you have a cycle that you go through. Your normal operating process that you go through. And the government, they have a buying process and they have a cycle of what they go through. And the cycle, the buying process could be the procurement process. It could be their budgeting process. It could be their HR process. It could be you know many different things. But when you take what you go through and what they go through and you understand both sides to it, that's how you can increase your sales. If you don't understand both sides, and you're thinking, I'm just, I've been marketing. I don't know why they're not calling me back or I've, you know, I've met with them. I don't know why we're not doing business. By understanding your audience, then you can actually do better. Uh, I was having a conversation with Chris earlier. Chris was saying, you know, I want to go to the government because I speak the language already. As I mentioned earlier, 60% of federal spending is done through DOD. So if you have a military background, you already understand the culture. You, you already have this established relationship in place. There's already a, a warm market for you to step into through that there. But when in Rome, do what the Romans do, right? When you're trying to go to a foreign country, it's called federal land. And they speak a different language. It's called governese. And you have to speak governese. So that's why I kind of teased you a little bit with SLED earlier, right? You got to understand they speak in jargons and acronyms and these different words. And you're thinking like, oh, what does that all mean? It takes time to learn governese. You're not going to learn it by one class. Anybody speak a foreign language? Okay. What, what foreign language do you speak? Spanish. Spanish? All right. All right. Do you comprendo Espanol? Okay, all right, good. I'm asking people over to Cherokee. Cherokee? All right. Like learning Chinese. 
So how do you say hello in Cherokee? TV says how, but I know that's not right. <laughs> how is it? Osio. Okay. That's almost like Korean. Similar. It's very actually, you know, it's very simple. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Yeah, in Korean is Anyo Hase Yo. Yeah. So that's hello. So Yeah. Okay. All right. But to learn, you're learning Cherokee, but it takes time. You're not just gonna jump in there and say, Oh, you know what? I'm fluent. And so it takes time. And so as you are building your business in the government market, understand that you get the direct results that you want is impacted by the amount of investment that you put into it. And if, you, if you're not learning the language, if you're not out there um, hanging around the people that speak the language, you're not going to learn the, the, be able to speak the language. So, so that's part of it. And so when you're going to do business with the government, you have to understand their buying cycle. So let's look at different fiscal years. There's a business fiscal year. So business is typically January to December 31st. And we'll look at some other uh, type of business fiscal year in a second. There's the federal fiscal year, which is October 1st to September 30th. And then there's most states is July 1st to June 30th. So the state just finished back in, you know, June 30th. And so now they're in the first quarter, whereas the federal, the, the federal we are in the fourth quarter for the federal. July, August, and September is the fourth quarter. And we'll talk about why that's important in a second. 46 states uses the June 30th as the end of the year for them. And these states, they got big egos. So, and, you know, I can understand why Texas have big egos and New York have big egos, but I'm not sure why Alabama has big ego. Uh, but they have to choose their own fiscal year. Anybody from Alabama? Nobody? Oh, it's okay. My wife's from Michigan. And uh, so I understand why they have big egos. Actually, I, you know, Alabamans are awesome and I have no preference. It doesn't matter where you're from. But they all have their own fiscal year. So Georgia, what is it? June 30th, because Georgia is part of the 46 states. All these other states, if you want to do business with them by understanding their fiscal year, you can actually be more productive when you're engaging them. And we'll talk about the, fisc the four fiscal cycle for the four quarters and how that ties back into all the stuff here. So at the state level, you got first quarter, second, third, and fourth, right? So in the first quarter, the 46 states, and then the, you know, so July 1st to September, this is the first quarter. And so this is when they're planning their project and they're kicking off new projects and they're planning for the next fiscal year. So this is their planning quarter. And then by the second quarter, which is October to December, Spending starts to kick in a little bit, and the go governor is reviewing the budget for the next fiscal year. And by the third quarter, January to March, they're going through a legislative session, and the, the state legislators are involved, and they're approving new budgets for the upcoming fiscal year. And so that's kind of where they're going through. And then by the fourth quarter, uh, they have all this money, and they have to spend it. And um, even though they may spend it, but the, they award the contract. So spending it is different in the government market. When I say spend it, that doesn't necessarily mean that you start the training immediately. They're just saying, okay, we're gonna award the contract to your training company, and we're gonna bring you in uh, three times in this month, four times in this month, and, and for the next 12 months, or it might be a, tr a contract for the next three years to do training. So, so th that's what I mean by 
spending not necessarily being delivered immediately at that during the fourth quarter. It's not delivered only in the fourth quarter. It's delivered all throughout the year, but it's awarded during most of it during the fourth quarter. Any questions about this quarter, the four quarters? You see, you start to see how it impacts your strategy a little bit now. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right, so looking at local and uh, counties and cities, right? 43% of state, local, county, cities uses the June. And then some, because we looked at state earlier, now I'm blending in counties and cities and state. Now we're looking at all, you know, sled together. So some actually use a traditional calendar year. December is the end of the year for them. And a few September, and then some are really creative and they just kind of, it might be January, it might be February, it might be whatever month, right? But these are June, if you're doing at the state, the county, the city level, most of them will use June 30th as the end of the year. Keep that in mind, if you're doing marketing to Fulton County, you wanna understand what their fiscal year is. If you were doing marketing to uh, Cook County in Illinois, which is Chicago, right? You wanna understand what their fiscal year is so that you match your marketing, you match your effort accordingly. All right, most fiscal year fits the natural business cycle though. So for businesses, you as a corporation, uh, you're looking at from, okay, how does it fit my, my need in my fiscal year? And so let's look at that there. So for most businesses, they use the calendar year. Now, 65% of corporations publicly traded uh, use the calendar year. So, you know, different companies use different fiscal year. 99% of all small businesses use the calendar year. Because, you know, it's too complex. You know, why, why make it complex for yourself? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you can still use fiscal year. You, you can, you can yeah. do um, accounting. So there's the IRS, there's fiscal year, and there's accounting. They're all separate, but you can merge the three. Uh, I'm not an accountant, so I'm not going to talk about how to merge all three. <laughs> but these, you know, 99%, which most of you use the calendar year. But different industry use different type of fiscal year. So for retail, retail stores, what would your guess be? January 31st. January 31st is the end of the year. Yeah. All right, anybody else? Different thoughts? December 31st. December 31st? Okay, some. So why, why January 31st is a good end of the year for retail stores? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, and then, <laughs> but what happens, so they, they're doing this here because the biggest volume of purchases for retail store comes in, in December, right? But why, they, they can still end December 31st because, you know, Black Friday is over by then, right? But why January 31st, though? What happens after all these purchases? Yes. All the return happens. <laughs> so they want to be able to capture all the returns to make sure that they, they're, they're accounting for the that side of it as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So, so retail stores, you know, most of them, February 1st to Jan uh, January 31st. That's because that is how we spend money is during the holiday seasons. Now, what about school systems? What, what's the ideal fiscal year for them? No idea? Because you sell to school system. I mean, they, they're part, they have money to spend. Okay. Yeah, All right. On You're on the right track. Most of them are July 1st. Yeah. You know, so they start the new year and then they get ready for the students to come back, right? And so during the they plan during the you know during the summer, and so J July comes around so they can kind of kick off the budget you know as the students are incoming into the classroom. So that's kind of how some school system works. Now again, not all school system work that way, but most of them. What about resorts? If you if you have a resort, you, you got commercial property and your resort, Chris. How how would you? What kind of fiscal year would you plan around that? Um, I think probably uh, in May. In May would be the end of the year or the beginning of the year. The end of the year. Okay. Why? Because you have your summer. Okay, so why not end it after your biggest season, the summer months? Okay, all right. I mean, there's no right or wrong. So, but most of them, they capture the summer months, which is where their biggest money is coming from, and they want to include that in their final report. You want your, you want your fourth quarter to be your biggest money, right? So that's that's what they want to show. They want to show ramp, ramp, ramp. Ooh, a lot of money, and they close out the year and start ramp, ramp, ramp. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So that's their their cycle. So, so does that make sense in terms of the fiscal year and everybody? Now, what happens if you're in landscaping? What type of fiscal year should you do? Calendar year. Mm-hmm. So when do you make the most money if you're a landscaping? Spring and summer, right? Uh, so that, you know, and most of them use the calendar year, but you know, if you're in that and you're a large company, you might want to consider a different fiscal year outside of the calendar year. What about if you are in um, um, a few niche industry like you you do uh, you're in the travel business. Yeah, same thing. Similar to resorts. Right. Okay. So, what about your airline company? Yeah, they do. But when do people travel the most? Holidays, 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 right? Holidays, yeah. So they might do a regular calendar year because that's you know that's when people travel the most during November, December, um, January, New Year's, and so forth. So so just think through your own business. You know, right now you don't have to worry too much because you fall into the ninety nine percent. But as you grow, you might want to be strategic. Or if you're in a different industry, like one of the company, a janitorial company, uh, most of their clients is tied to the uh, tourism industry. Like Zoo Atlanta is one of the biggest clients. And they, they, they have a crew there and they clean up. But during the winter season, they have very few people go to the zoo. Too cold to be outside. And so they're not getting most tourism during that time. And so it may be what you do, it may not be, it may have its own season, right? Based upon the type of clientele you cater to and so forth. So think through that, but more importantly, think through how the government, what their cycles are and how you address them. All right, so let's go into the 10 steps that government go through to engage you. So step number one, they go through a need. They have a problem. Hey, you know, millennials are coming to the workforce. And boomers are retiring, and Gen X, we don't care about them, right? That's kind of like the 
the, the, the most of the world revolves around, we got to cater to millennials. We care about boomers, but Gen X, you just kind of lost in the middle somewhere. Uh, so you got boomers, you got Gen X, you got millennials, you got Gen Z, which, and then what's after that? What's after Gen Z? Anybody know? What? End of the world, you know. <laughs> You know, and so I actually thought Gen A, and I looked it up, they actually call it Gen Alpha. So I was thinking the right direction. So, so, but that's kind of the different generations. Gen Alpha? Because you're already at the end of the alphabet, Gen Z, so you gotta go back to Gen A, so Gen Alpha. So Alpha is the beginning, right? So the government, they go through a need and based upon their need, they're thinking, okay, we have, we have boomers retiring. We got Gen X, but we got millennials. Millennials are anywhere from 25 to 40 in that about 15 year age range right there. And they're, they're, they're no longer college students. They're a few years ago, they were college students, but they're, they're in the workforce now. And they are coming into leadership position and they, be, they are becoming the, the heart of corporate America. So they understand we have a need. So they're going to need someone like you to go in there and talk about cultural and talk about uh, age gaps and talk about uh, diversity and diversity, not from just color and, you know, but diversity in terms of age diversity and so forth. And so they have a need and they're gonna say, okay, we have a problem. And why is it that millennials will only work for us for six months and they leave to go somewhere else? We gotta, we gotta address that because HR turnover is, is high, right? That's most, when it comes to people, that is your most expensive part of any organization's investment is your investment to your people. So they have a need, I'm using that as an example. They say, we have a problem, we have a need. Or it could be the CDC. CD, CDC says, hey, you know what? There's this thing called the Zika virus and it's impacting South Central America and now it's hitting Florida and it's hitting South, Southern Texas, it's hitting California. How do we, we have to study this here and we have to maybe find a cure for it. So that's a need. When the Zika virus happened uh, about five years ago, CDC said, okay, we have a real problem and then they have to go to the next step. So the next step, which is number two, right? We have, to, we need a budget. So the government goes through a budget process and the CDC can't just get money out of nothing. They have to go to Congress. They have to go to their superiors in HHS and say, hey, uh, we at the CDC, we have the Zika virus issue. We're the end user. We have a problem, we need a solution please give us funding. And Congress authorized four years ago, authorized $2 billion just for Zika related research. And of that $2 billion, they actually said, okay, we're going to hire uh, pest exterminators to go and spray all along the borders of, from Florida all the way through California. And we're going to spray kill mosquitoes and that was part of the funding so so if you understand the need well they have a need then they have to create a funding a, a budget once they go through the budget phase they have to do a forecast of when they're going to spend that money and who might be able who you know to do that type of work so that's step three then they go through the next step which is the market survey. Sometimes they call it a market study. Sometimes they call it an RFI. What is the RFI? Request for information. So they're saying, hey, we, we, we have a problem. We've got funding for it. And we've got an anticipated of when we're going to spend this money. But now we got to find who can potentially do this work here. So they have to do a market study. In the regulations, the regulation says, they must do a market study. 
They can't just say, oh, I'm going to use Deborah or I'm, I'm going to use somebody. They can't just do that. They have to do a market study. Now, there are some rare situations to where they can just bypass the market study. Like, for example, if a pharmaceutical company created a drug that's already been proven to, to alleviate or cure the Zika virus, then they can just say, hey, we're not going to do a market survey. We're just going to do a direct award. And they can do that too. But most of the time, the regular says, that's called JA. JA stands for Justification of Acquisition or Justification um, Authorization. It means both of those terminology. JA, where they can say, I'm going to do a JA, Justification of Acquisition to this company because they have the only technology or the only solution. Or it might be that they were working on this research project for us and they were uh, and we believe that they will be the best company to do it for this new type of research for us. So it could be something like that there. Yes. Another term uh, terminology for market studies called sources sought. And so when you when they put out a sources sought, you're going to see on FBO and on FBO you're going to see it either as an RFI or as a source of salt. And we, most of the time it's a source of salt. And when you see a source of salt, that means they're going to say, hey, we don't know who can spray the mosquitoes along and who might be interested. We don't even know if there's enough company out there that has a big old tank that can spray this stuff here along the highways. We don't know who can do all that there. And if anyone can do this here, these are the five things or the three things we want you to do. So they, they're saying, submit your capability statement. Uh, tell us uh, your capabilities in terms of what type of equipment you have. And tell us, uh, can you do how many states? And so based upon that, they're going to, obviously, you need to be registered in SAM already if it's a federal project. Uh, that's part of the requirement. The, you know, if you're responding to a source of salt on FBO, you have to be registered in SAM already. Uh, it's very rare that they don't go through SAM, um, unless it's a small project like a micro purchase. Micro purchases are low dollar amounts. If it's uh, a micro purchase, they don't have to go through the standard buying process. So yes, you have to be registered. You have to have certain things in place before you can respond to a source of salt. But most companies bypass this and they, they start at the solicitation. They said, well, I'm, I'm not going to respond to a source of salt or market study because in the source of salt, when you read through it, it's going to say, this is not a project. We're not even guaranteed we're going to spend the money. And we're not even looking for you to submit a proposal. We just want some information about you. That's what the source of salt says from a general level. And so you said, well, I'm going to wait until it gets to step number five, the solicitation. Now, the solicitation sometimes is called RFP. What does RFP stand for? Request for proposal. What's the RFQ? Request for? Quote, yes. And what is it? IFB. What is it? Invitation for bid. So it's an IFB. So in different agencies use different terminology, right? At the federal market, sometimes they use the word solicitation to mean all these different things. So when you get to the IFB, they're ready to write the bid. IFB? I mean, invitation to bid. Uh, no, it, it means that there, there are certain types of uh, products or services use certain type of contacting methods here. So if it's a service, most of the time it's an RFP. If it's a product like you, you, it's more of an RFQ or IFB. So products are mainly, so Deborah, you know, you, you have a product and a service. 
And so it might be both. Some product is, um, you ship it and you're done, right? right? Some requires installation and servicing behind it. And so it just depends on, but most people wait until the solicitation comes out. That's the worst time. Why? Because everybody's trying to get it. Yes. Competition. Everybody sees it. It's on the street. <laughs> everybody wants a piece of it at that time, right? So the best time is really at step number four. Here. This is the best time to engage them when they're doing the market survey. And they say, hey, send me your KBL statement. Uh, send me your, you know, your management team of, of how you plan to solve this problem. That's when you engage in. That's how you get sole source contracts. Market survey is before pre-solicitation. Market survey is just the market study. Yes. They may not, it may never become a solicitation. It might just come out as an award. And that's called a sole source. What does sole source stand for? What does it mean? No. You're the only one. Sole, S-O-L-E means only, right? Or one. So in a sole source, when they're doing the market survey, they're saying, hey, let us know if you're a woman-owned. Let us know if you're a veteran-owned. Let us know if you have a GSA schedule. Let us know if you have any contracting vehicle. They just want to know. But a contracting officer, when they look through their market survey, and they say, well, I didn't get any response from veteran-owned businesses, so I guess I'm not going to set aside for veteran companies because there's no one was interested, right? So if you're a veteran-owned business, they're saying, well, I can't. there's no veteran interested in this project, so I can't go veteran. Um, there's no woman responded, no women owned business responded, and there's no small business responded, so I'm just going to make it open competition and let even the large company bid on it. So that's when you respond to it. And you, you need to say in there, like part of the strategy is I tell companies, I say, hey, tell them that you are a women-owned business. Tell them you are a veteran, you know, an 8A a company. Better yet, in your email that you sent to them, actually, will you consider, this is very important. So if you want to write down anything, this is probably the notes you want to write down today. Will you consider sole sourcing this here to a women-owned business or a veteran-owned business or a hub zone company or an 8A company? Whichever is the most you know relevant to you. Will you consider sole sourcing this project to a veteran-owned business or 8A or whichever one that you qualify for? You don't know. You, you, there's no. They have a rough budget. They know what they're looking for, but they trying to see. The regulation says they have to do a market survey, unless they can do a JNA. And so, if they really don't know who they want to award it to, they do a market survey. Now, think about from the contracting officer perspective, because right now you're thinking from your own perspective, right? But if you were the contracting officer and you were in their shoes, you have a stack of projects you have to put out. Do you care who gets awarded that project? No, no you just want the most qualified company that's going, to, that's going to do the work right, do it right the first time, and at a competitive price. Pricing is not even your most important thing. You have a lot of projects. The contracting officer represents the different agencies and the, the different program directors and the different supervisors. And so the end user is the agency. Contracting officer work on behalf of the agency. They're just a procurement arm, a purchasing department. And so contracting officer, their job is to put out all this project. They made a, a contracted officer, uh, who was here last week? 
for the big heavy hitter big set. Craig Carnes with HUD. What's the budget that he manages? Yeah, and he sent us a, for your credit, mm -hmm. he made us feel so welcome. He, he sent me a one free email. Yeah, and he sent me a one free email. Awesome. He sent us a one free email. That's great. Yeah, thanks for the feedback on that. Yeah. So, awesome. Yeah, we have fun doing it. He manages 75 contracting professionals, and his budget that he manages is a billion dollars. So from his perspective and from all his contracting officers, they get all this money, they have to spend all these projects that they have to put out. They just want the most qualified company and they want the easiest way to put the projects out. Do you think they want to go through six months of a procurement process? No, of course not. So if they can sole source it to a woman owned business, do you think they prefer that? If they can sole source it to an 8A company, because the paperwork is easy. Yeah. And if I social said, do I have to read 20 proposals? No. Do you no. think they want to read 20 proposals? Yeah, I needed to write down there. Why would they want to source it to a woman on business? Why? Because the regulations allow them to source it. But it wouldn't be considered a preference. It depends on who responds to the market survey. They can set it aside. Like if two women-owned businesses said were interested, two women business or more says that they're interested, the regulation says that they have to consider setting aside for women competition. That's the regulation. But if no women-owned business respond to it, then they can say, hey, we're just going to social it to the one 8 company that responded. If two 8 companies responded, they might do a set aside for 8 Or if nobody, then they say, I guess, no small business is interested, so we'll just go to large companies. But when they sole source it, they have to do a JNA also, a justification of award. So they do a justification of, of award or justification of acquisition, uh, and they, they, it will go from market survey, and it will bypass the solicitation, and it will come out as an award. So they actually skip one, two steps. When they do a sole source, they skip two steps. As a contract officer, I like to skip two steps. <laughs> I don't want to read 20 proposals that is submitted. Oh, right. So the contract officer is supposed to be the contracting officer, not the estimate, the contracting officer. Right. Okay. So what if it's the estimate? Um, if you were here Thursday, I think Craig says, no. Chastity said, remember the panelists? Right. Chast Chastity said, you're trying to reach out to me, but I'm not the best person. Who did she say that you need to build a good relationship with? Contract officer representative, the core, C-O-R. And we'll look at that in a second. Uh, we'll look at the relationship chart in terms of uh, how all that ties to, to this here. So from a contracting endeavor on your end, the market survey is the most important part. And then you want to ask, will you consider sole sourcing this here to a woman owned, a better owned, hub zone, 8A company? Mm -hmm. uh, for, so do you know, okay, is all this information available online no. as far as where they're at on the process? Uh, sometimes, yes. It is available. You can go and find the forecast. The, the regulation says that every agency must put out a forecast for small businesses. So if you want to do business with DLA for some of the things you're doing, or PBS is actually a good agency for you. Do you know what PBS stands for? What does PBS stands for? Public Broadcasting Service? <laughs> no. No, 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 not that PBS. Not that PBS. That's, uh, that's TV speak, right? Uh, Governance PBS stands for Public Building Service. Public Building Service is a sub agency or an arm of GSA. So they're GSA, but they're a division of GSA and they manage a lot of the federal building out there. So if you're in commercial, if you're in janitorial, if you're in cleaning, if you are in IT, anything that touches a building, landscaping, all of that stuff, you need to focus on PBS as one of your key agencies. 
You're in training. What's the key agency for you to focus on? <laughs> OPM. What is OPM? OPM in the in the business world, other people's money, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the government world, when you're speaking governees, what does this stand for? <laughs> Office of Personnel Management. That would be a key agency for you as a trainer, as a as a business coach, as an executive coach, as a uh, organizational um, alignment type of corporation that you do, OPM is key. What is DLA? DLA is Defense Logistic Agency. So DLA uh, does most of the purchasing for the Department of Defense. GSA does all the negotiation for all agencies. DLA does the negotiation for most of the DOD spending. Defense Logistics Agency. So these agencies are engaging you. They go through this process here. And so you want to respond to them at the market. And then if no one, they don't find anybody to sole source or to do a JNA with, then it comes out as a solicitation. This is 95% true to most agencies, state, local as well, but they have tweaks, but this is speaking strictly around federal, uh, but state and local use a similar process. Yeah. So they go through solicitation, then you submit the proposal and then they, they get to read the proposals. Now, how many companies out there that can do construction? How many? How many construction companies out there? Oh, I thought you were saying in this room. No, not in this room. Oh, no. How many construction companies are out there? Yeah. How about millions? Millions. Okay. Millions of construction companies out there. How many training organizations out there? Millions. Do you think the contracting officer wants to read 50 proposals or 100 proposals or 1,000 proposals? So they do a narrowing, they use the market and the solicitation to narrow the number of companies that will want to write a proposal because they don't want to read all the proposals. So keep in mind, so for example, in real estate, I've actually seen this here. They will say, hey, we are looking for a commercial office space. We want it to be 50,500 square feet. We want it to be on Chamley Tucker Road, how many properties fits that requirement? Probably just one. They already have an idea of where they want it to, which leasing agent they want to use, which office space they want to use, but the law says they have to go through this process. So if you see that project, what should you do? Don't even bother. Because they already, they wrote that solicitation. So they know who well, exactly what they want. Yeah, the yeah. Like, here's what we're sourcing the project or whatever. Oh, and then if you already have access to the owner or the, to, to the, you know, or if you manage the property, yeah, then it's fine. But if you're going to say, well, let me go search for it, it's already written for somebody else in mind. So this is, that's commercial. Now let's, let's talk about other industry, right? I've seen projects where they say um, must have your own equipment because most companies rent equipment, right? right? So, so it was a so this is an example of a dredging project. So you must own your own dredging equipment and must be within 50 mile radius of I think it was Jackson, Mississippi, or something like that. For well, how many? dredging company, environmental company, have an office in Mississippi that has dredging equipment. That's it. You know, just two or three, maybe, maybe one, you know? And so if you see something that narrow, that means they don't want to read a lot of proposals and they already have one or two company in mind. So that's not a true open competition. If it's not true open competition, 
you're going to go spend 20, 30 hours preparing your proposal and reading the solicitation and putting your team together and going through meetings after meetings, don't do it. Because it's meant for somebody. Uh, FBO.gov. Most of it's FBO.gov. Now, for those of you who are members of GCA, we actually give you software. Do you know what software that is? Gov Directions. We provide you Gov Directions, which is, as a member of GCA, that software costs you $1,000 if you were to go and buy that software. But as a member of GCA for $499 for the year, you get it for free. Gov Directions. FBO gives you federal opportunities, the solicitations for the federal government. Gov Directions, we actually aggregate 3,000 counties, 35,000 cities, and, and other type of pseudo government like school systems and hospital systems, and we put it all into one database. And so you can search everything so instead of going to 35 different cities to search for opportunities and 3,000 counties, Georgia has how many counties? How many? More than that. More than that. Almost. Texas have like 230 something. Georgia has about 140 something. Yeah, so we have the second most counties. So if you were just gonna do work in the counties in the state of Georgia, that's a 140 website you have to go and visit. But Gov Directions aggregates all of that put into one place. So it's free as a member of GCA. So it's part of your benefit of being a member of GCA. Then the awarded. In the award, they, they have to go through they have a team of people. If it's a small project, the contracting officer can just make a decision, right? They don't have to meet with anything. It's, it's a waste of time to meet with, you know, 20 people or five people on, on the award uh, sourcing board to talk about a $20,000 project. They're going to say, okay, hey, we've got um, $20,000. I'm going to choose this one. And this is why I'm choosing this company. But if it's a $20 million project, the source review board will meet and they will say, hey, we're going to score. We might, they might split it into different um, parts of the proposal. They might have the technical proposal and they might have the price proposal. And the, the price proposal, that team looks at that only purely on price and the technical proposal team will only review it from the technical, the most qualified company that can deliver the work. And then the pricing team look, puts in order of the, the companies that have the best pricing and the ones that, that um, and they rank it differently in that regard. And some, some, not the federal market, but some counties and cities, they throw out the lowest price and they throw out the highest price. Some, some of it do it that way. Some, they don't care, but uh, some automatically awarded to the lowest and some they just, they award it to the most competitive um, in terms of pricing strategy. But the award, they review that and then they choose. Now, from generally speaking, at the federal market, do they prefer lowest price or what? The best product. Okay, what was that? The best product. Best, they use a term called best value. Best. But best value, best product, best services, but they call it best value. 60% of how the federal market buys is best value. 40% of it is LPTA. LPTA stands for lowest price technically acceptable. Just because you're lowest price doesn't mean that you're technically acceptable, right? You may not be qualified to do the work. So they have to, they call it LPTA. Lowest price technically acceptable. 40% is LPTA, 60% is best value at the federal level. Now at the state level, what do they, what do they like? Most of the time, it's probably like 80% of the time, it's lowest price. At the county and city level, what is it? 
probably lowest price. 90%, 95% of the time, it's actually lowest price. So which agency is better for you? To The federal is going to allow you to have more profit. And they have the most money. At the county level, the city, they have tight budget. And so they're not going to, like, give you an example. The uh, Ringgold County is building out a new website. And one of the companies that's bid on it, their budget for that is about $35,000. North Carolina, the state level, is building out a website. And the company, same company bidding on that project is bidding about $120,000. County, I mean city versus state, big price, similar in nature to the website. Now, healthcare.gov, you know how much that costs? Oh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. They didn't, and it didn't even work. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that was another big issue. Yep. They finally took it away from that Canadian company and gave it to, I think, Accenture to rebuild it. And then they gave them like, you know, five or $10 million also to rebuild it after it failed. So you can see why, you know, millions of dollars to a few thousand dollars. So the, from from the federal, state, local, keep in mind that the game is different. I have no idea, but yes. <laughs> in my situation where um, there are no competitors, there's no access, do I have to give it to them to make a difference? Uh, the only discount you give is um, when you apply for your GSA schedule or when you're net 30, you give them a 2% discount. Outside of that, sell it for market rate. If you are the only product. I'm new. Yeah. <laughs> they have 30 days to pay you. The regulation says they have 30 days to pay you. Now, if you're a small business, the executive order that was put out by President Obama, which I think is still in effect under President, uh, the current president, I don't, I have my own opinion. So, uh, so the, I can't link the name and the, the, the honor of the title of the president together. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. But, uh, but under different administration, based on politics, you have to understand that under a Republican administration, what do they tend to spend money on? Defense. So that's the agency you want to focus on. If it's a Democrat, uh, you know, administration, they spend it on uh, what they call civilian agencies, Department of Education, uh, EPA, those type of agencies. So that's what you shift your focus on. So to me, we, from a political perspective, don't bleed red, don't bleed blue. What should we do? Be green, right? That's it. That's it. That's all that matters for us. So, regardless of your personal opinion, keep that in check. Don't don't go on social media and say, "Hey, you know what? I love this president, or I hate this president." Be green. FEMA will be one key agency, um, but there's different agencies as well. What industry are you in? Food, food services. Food. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, Puerto Rico is treated as you know, potentially the 51st state, um, and so they they have dual government, right? 
So they have their own, but they use some of the same practice, some of the same regulations. Any entity, any organization that receives federal funding, they must use federal regulations. So like, for example, right, the state of Georgia, uh, one of the policies that was heavily enacted in the state of Georgia was you must have a uh, Georgia driver license to be able uh, or you the Georgia driver license must only be taken in English. That's that's the that was a state policy or well, the state was trying to pass that law that yeah the last few years it's still I mean, they're still trying to push that law that if you are going to pass the Georgia driver's license, you have to do it in English only because well, English is the language. Well, I understand that. But because they receive federal funding for Department of Transportation all the way down to the DMV, they can't enact that law. <laughs> but and so I actually went to the governor and testified to their team down there. I said, hey, uh, we came to the US. My parents didn't speak a single word of English. And if you require for them to pass the driver's license only in English, they will never have their driver's license. And they will not have a job because they can't drive to work. They will not have a job and they will be on welfare all their life. Is that the type of America system you want to have. And I said, you know, there are, there's different policies, but not all policy is conducive to achieve what your goals are. And so, but that's another story. Because federal funding requires that you have to provide federal services to your constituents in a language that they can understand. That's why all hospitals, uh, they receive federal funding Department of all these different agents that receive funding, they have to have translators. They have to have, and so if you're in the training industry, translation and language services is a great industry to add to what you do. All right, so award. So they go through award, then they have to manage the performance. You do the work, they manage the work, and then they have to make sure that you are in compliance. So that's step nine for them. And so they have the ACO, the TCO, the COR, COTR. The uh, ACO is, what does that stand for? The CO is what? Contracting officer. So the ACO is the administrative contracting officer. So what is the TCO? Good guess. But the TCO is, you don't want to see the TCO ever. The termination contracting oh, officer. No. <laughs> and the ACO is the administration. The administrative contracting officer. The COTR, or sometimes it's COR. COR is the contracting officer's representative. The COTAR, they, that's pronounced COTAR. The COTAR is the contracting officer's technical representative. So sometimes it's generic work, so it's not a big deal. But sometimes it's so specific that they need a technical expert to be part of the process. So these are the people that make sure that you're in compliance and that the work is going well and that uh, they know what a two by four is and a four by four. And they, they know that door standards is, what's door, st door standard sizes? 36 is the minimum size, right? It could be larger, but minimum size is 36 and all the stuff there. So that's the compliance officer. They also want to make sure that your accounting system is proper. Uh, at a minimal, you need to have standard accounting practices, but if you start to get a lot of multi high dollar, you need to have DCAA compliant accounting system. That's fine for now, but once you start to get to the $500,000 million contracts, then your county system has to measure to a higher standard, which is DCAA, Defense Contract Audit Agency, DCAA. And your software, QuickBooks can be manipulated to be DCA compliant. 
but there are specific software out there for accounting purposes in the government market that's already set up to be DCA compliant. Don't worry about DCA compliant right now. When you when you win a five hundred thousand dollar project, come back and see me, and we'll we'll go to that course there. Yes. So yes. Yeah, so we'll, we'll that's a, that's a separate course. So but but put it in the back of your mind, and we'll come back to that. And then finally, step number ten that they go through is the closure. They have to close out the books. Now closure for you is easy. Closure for you means that you've submitted the reports, you've uh, have them sign off that the work was done right, and you invoice and you got paid, and you're done. That's closure for you. It's easy. But think back to closure again. Put yourself in the shoe of the contracting officer. They have to take all the reports that you've done, all the invoicing. They have to take all of the original solicitation. They have to take all of that, combine it into one package and then close out the book. So their, their work here is just as hard as the whole process. What's your goal if, that's, if, if you know that they have to go through a very lengthy process to close out their books, what's your goal? Keep everything Make it easy, Make it easy for them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If they say, hey, I need this document, don't send it to them five weeks later. Yeah, yeah you know what? Let me look it up. In fact, I have it in front of me. Do you want me to email it to you? Do you want me to mail it to you? Make it easy for them. They're going to enjoy working with you. And guess what? The next time there is a sole source opportunity, who, the, who, who are they going to look for? You. And if they have a friend that's looking for the same service that you just sold to them, they can say, hey, hey you know what? Claudette just sold me this, sir. And man, it was a joy to work with her. You need a, you need a here's her done number. Here, here's a copy of her capability statement. You might want to social search to the, the project. And so make it easy for them. Yeah, you're a Oh, my God. It depends on the industry you're in. So compliance, right? Part of compliance is that if you are a women-owned business, the contractor officer must validate that you are a women-owned business. That's part of compliance. Part of compliance is they have the option to come and visit you at your office. They're not going to do it, but that is, that is an option that they can come and I want to request to meet you at your office to make sure that you are a women-owned business. So that's part of compliance. Part of compliance says that if you are in, um, your, you do food, so do you have your health, ins your health inspection? Is it posted? That's part of compliance. They can come and choose to look at that. They might ask for a copy of that. Uh, you can't sell commercial food from your own home kitchen. You have to, you, you, you've been to prep right down the street from there? Oh, if you're in catering and food services, um, prep is a co-working space for food food company, so you can go and cook your food there, do everything there, and serve it without having using their commercial kitchen versus um, you know using using. Can we go eat there too? They actually have a restaurant there too. Yeah. So. It's I mean it's it's, it's Chambly Tucker, you know, this exit up here to the right, and then down the the access road there. It's a huge facility there. So uh, yeah, go look at it. But yeah, so keep, make it easy for them. Different industry compliance means different things. All right, so let's talk about the 12 steps that you have to go through. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this here, but because uh, this is another class that we train. And so, but, but we talk about what the government have to go through to engage you. This is what you have to go through to engage them. I call the 12 steps ASRAM ROP CC. It's an acronym and it's, uh, she is the goddess of government contracting. I used to have a, um, a white lady up here, and all my sisters say, hey, hey, you know what? Can't we be goddesses also? And so I, I put a new image up here because, you know, everybody can be a goddess except guys. Well, I guess guys could be goddesses too, right? We live in a new age, brave new world, so guys can be goddesses also. <laughs> 
But uh, so the guys that got the contracting, her first name is Asarim. Her last name is Rap CC. It's a rap name. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I told my wife that, you know, if we have another daughter, I'm going to name her Asarim. Oh. And my wife said, we're having no more kids. <laughs> But Asherim Rock CC is her, that's the goddess of government contracting. So A stands for assessment. So you, this, this is the 12 steps you have to go through to engage government. So you have to assess where you're at. Where am I? I'm trying to go to DC, right? When, when your, G, G, your GPS only works if it knows where you're at, right? right? If you're trying to win government contract and you're ignoring all the signs of where you're at, like these signs might be, you know what? My business have no business credit and I need to start building my business credit. That You need to know that. You need to acknowledge that and say, okay, I'm going to own it that I have no credit. Your part of assessment is, do you have past performance? In the government market, they use past performance. What is past performance? Yeah, Projects that you've done. Well, you're a new company. So it's the chicken or the egg, right? My, my, yeah, my, my son says, is it the hen or the egg or is it the rooster, right? He actually brought a third element to it. <laughs> that's, that's an important question. Mm -hmm. So past performance has to do with different levels. Personal past performance in some situations can be counted. Corporate past performance, government past performance, or actually four, teaming past performance. So for example, on some projects, they might say, hey, just give us three projects that you've done. And if they say general like that, you can use corporate. I've done work for Coca-Cola, I've done work for Home Depot, I've done work for you know this company, and that's fine. If they say, Federal, or they might say government, like this one of the projects this uh, company is working on, a website project, they say, since we are a university, what university, what edu they can say, you know, what educational website have you built? And so you can't just use any website. You have to use educational websites that you've built. So it just depends on what they add. But most of that is general. Give us three references that you've done, and so you can use your corporate past performance. But if you're a brand new startup and you had no past performance, what do you do? Don't bid on government work? But they require three. If you don't have three, what do you do? Partner. What's another word for partner? What did you say? Lie? Okay, lie, lie, that's a very good point. What does lying do for you? Yes. You will lose a contract and you yeah. can go to jail. Right. Yes. You, can, you cannot lie to the federal government. Yes. In fact, let me give you a quick story. There's this very successful company called Microtech. And this is, you know, I'm not just telling rumors because this came out. It was found factual. And so he got in trouble, all this stuff. Here. So I'm telling you facts here. Well, to the best of my knowledge, what was reported as facts. Uh, Tony Jimenez started a small business IT company, got his 8 day certification. He went and grew his company from a few hundred thousand to about $300 million a year. It came out later that he lied on his 8 day application. No way. Something wasn't right on his 8 day application. And so they took they did take some of the contracts away. They, they said, you have to leave your company or we're going to close your company down. So that's the first thing. They say, well, you know what? Because he's got all these projects and they're critical to government. Because if we close down his company, all these different projects that he's working on, all his staffing, I mean, $300 million of work that you're doing for the government is critical. We can't shut down his company. So they said, well, you have to leave your company and allow the SBA to send in a um, kind of like an interim CEO to run the company. And so they fired him from his own company because he lied to the SBA. Uh, he actually negotiated with them so that he didn't go to jail. 
and he agreed to certain terms. And so after about three or four years being out of his own company, the, uh, he finally went back to the SBA to get reinstated and say, hey, you know, I've learned my lesson. I'm going to do things a certain way. And, and so they reinstated him back to his own company. But he went from about $250, $300 million a year down to about $40, $50 million a year while he was gone. And then now he's trying to ramp back up. So I know you're joking about it, but it's a serious matter in the government market. So you, you, you can embellish, and that's fine. Embellishment, as long as you can validate any embellishment. So don't, but never lie. So. Uh, yeah, we actually train you how to get 8A certification and so forth. Um, it's a process. Uh, to, for, because of time here, I can't go into all the details, but we can have a side conversation around it. Yeah, when you submit... Yeah, when you submit your paperwork, it's going to be about this thick. Yeah, yeah, probably about uh, 200 pages total. So it's a process. Um, it's a lengthy process. But, you know, uh, 90, to, 90 days to a year, depending on who you get and how complex your company structure is and so forth. If it's just you and you only have like five years of history and you're doing... 50,000 50, to 200,000 in revenue, and you've been growing year after year, that's easy. But if you're doing five, six million, you got you know, multiple employees, multiple owners, it can be complex. All right, then you go to a strategy. You know where you're at, then you got to develop a strategy. Your strategy is, do you get certification? Do you get your 8A? Do you get your woman? When do you get your 8A certification? Uh, that's part of strategy. What kind of legacy? Do you want to build a legacy company, or do you want to uh, you know, give your company to your kids, or do you want to sell your company? Based on all those different things, your strategy is different. Our strategy is which agency, right? Education, you got to learn to speak governance. It's a new language. And then you got to go through registration. Registration is being in SAM, being in the Georgia team marketplace, being in Fulton County, being in the city of Atlanta, all these different registration points you have to be in. Part of registration is getting your certification as a business owner as well. Then your image, your branding, your marketing. How, you got to have a branding and an image that speaks to government buyers. Anybody still using Gmail for your business email? Nobody? Okay, good. If you're still using Gmail or Yahoo or Hotmail or God forbid AOL. <laughs> all right, I still have my AOL, AOL account, but I don't use it anymore right um, but the government says if you can't even invest in five bucks a month in your professional image why should we trust you with a 50 million dollar contract or, or 500 thousand dollar project right and not that they won't award you a contract if you use a gmail but it's the perception of can they trust you right and so if they're choosing between a company that looks professionally in a company that looks like they're just trying to fly by, you know, whatever, then they're going to choose somebody else. And so part of your image is very important in the government market. Uh, your business name is important as well. Like I, I had a company, her company was called Visionary Construction, which is fine. But I said, but you want to do facilities management. You want to do janitorial. You want to do all these other things. Can you do those things under the name called Visionary Construction? I said, that doesn't make sense. Your name has some risk. Yes, that means you can only do door, and that's it. If you want to do other type of construction, it limits you. So those are some things about your branding, your imaging, and so forth. And, um, and then marketing, how to market, how to, what to say when you market to them. Uh, you know, we're going to have a class you know, to talk through all this in detail relationship, how to build relationship and how to uh, connect with people. Building a relationship in the government market is different than building a relationship in the commercial sector. Okay, good. Um, in the commercial market, if you want to get to know me, you say, hey, can we grab lunch? Or can, can you know, I, I, I'm going to the Atlanta Falcons Super Bowl uh, and uh, I've got a season ticket and so I'm going to let you have my season ticket. Super Bowl. Well, that Super Bowl ticket is probably worth about 
In the commercial world, not a big deal. In the government market, that's called bribery. Right? So, what's the threshold in the government market? You can give people, it's okay to give people, government employees, but there is a threshold. What's that amount? $20. All right? And that's a gift. You cannot give money. Money is zero. You cannot give any money. Yeah, things like that. Yeah, you do cookies, cake, just don't drizzle it with gold flakes. <laughs> 24 karat gold plates, you know, the cookie is what, $2,000. Don't do that, right? <laughs> so, but yeah, there's proper ways to do things in terms of relationship. And then how to find opportunities, how to write proposals, and then how to perform and deliver on the work. Number 11 is staying in compliance because you, you have your own compliance as well as they have compliance. And then number 12 is closing out the project. And we talk about you making it easy for them. So that's kind of the 12 steps that you go through. So, so for today, because we are out of time, I'm going to uh, wrap it up with this last chart here. Um, you have to, uh, part of understanding how the government work is understanding the different quarters, right? In quarter one, the government has a need, a budget, and a forecast. For you, you go through four steps, assessment, strategy, education, registration. So while they're looking to do planning, different things, uh, you're doing this part here in first quarter. In the second quarter, they're doing the market study, the market survey. And you're doing your imaging, marketing, and relationship building during this time. So this is the time where you market to them when they're doing their own marketing as well. How do you build a relationship? That's a very complex process, and um, uh, that that we do a whole course on that there. Yes. Yeah, so in fact, um, in the next few weeks, we're going to be the deep dive class on Wednesday. We're going to be addressing relationship building to, to some degree. Yes. Mm -hmm. I know we talked about we were going to try to be a one-stop shop as members. Can it say if I got a contract I want to bid? I can come in and say, hey, come in with me and help me secure this deal. As a member, how much would I have to pay? Or is that the same kind of service we do? To for us to be your teaming partner? Right. So we to do some team. teaming uh, as GCA. Uh, so we we provide our services in different ways, right? The first and most thing that we do is become a member, come to classes. And, and that's how you learn and you go and implement it on your own. But that normally takes a little bit longer time. So some people say, hey, um, is there another way how we work with GCA? And so another tool we have is we have our Gov Fast Track software, which is I created a roadmap of 965 steps. And I said, this is the blueprint. All the 12 steps I talked about, I actually go into it more detail with samples, templates, resources, links, and everything, which is a blueprint. So when, when I talk about capability statement, I actually give you samples of it. When I talk about creating a website that speaks to government, I actually give you samples of it. Uh, when I talk about creating a capability brief, I actually give you PowerPoint samples of this is what one looks like, and uh, you should make your model after this here. And so we have that software. So that's a, another way of how members engage us. A third way of how member engage us is to say, hey, you know what, I've got this awesome technology and uh, can I team with GCA where GCA actually goes and win the contract and I do the work. So that's another way of how we work. Uh, that is a very, very time intensive process. So we, we, don't, we can't work with everybody that way because it's just, we have to write the proposal. We have to do all the front side of it. And then we mark up the cost a little bit so that it covers our time and our margins. And then you have your own pricing. So that's another way how we work with companies. And then the fourth way of how we work with companies is we have our Gov Accelerator, our coaching program, to where I, we meet every week and I teach you, show you how to do it. And then you do the work and then I review the work to make sure it's done right. So we, we engage differently depending on 
your budget, how aggressive you want to be. And, you know, sometimes you may be, you want to be aggressive, but you don't have the, the budget. So in that situation, just be a member, come to classes and learn, because we teach the same thing. We just teach it in, in different format. The information is de de delivered differently based upon how aggressive you want to be, your budget and so forth. And some company, we have like our premier service. Some companies say, hey, I just want to write a check. I don't want to come to classes. I don't care if I'm a member or not, but I just want to write a check. And you, you build a proposal team, you build a capture management team, you source out the opportunities, and I just want to do the work. Let me know when I win a contract. And, and we have one or two companies that use that services as well. And that's, that's what I used to do, which is consulting work like that. And I try not to do a lot of that because it takes me away time from do training and different things. So we do some of that because there are a few clients that want that service, but not every, you know, most small business. I do what I do here because I like working with small business and, you know, empowering you is more rewarding than me doing all the grunt work for somebody else. And, and that's fine too, but that, that's just to pay the bills. The fun stuff is empowering you, training you and helping you grow. So quarter three, they go through solicitation, proposal, and award. You go through opportunity sourcing and proposal writing. So you're at a different stage with them. And then fourth quarter, they do solicitation, proposal, review, award. They match performance, compliance, and closure. And then you go through your five steps as well. And so that's kind of uh, in the fourth quarter, this is the final thoughts here. They're trying to complete all their acquisitions at the federal level, federal level by September 30th. It's what we call, they have the money and they, if they, it was obligated to them. And if they don't use it, it gets unobligated or deobligated. And, um, and so we call it use it or lose it. They don't use it, they're gonna lose it. And next year they might reduce their budget also. Say, well, if you didn't need it last year, then why do you need it again this year, right? So a few quick things here. Fourth quarter, you want to look for SAP projects, which is $250,000 or less. They want to go to, to small business. The regulation says that any SAP project must go to small businesses. So that's important. For you, that's what you're looking for. Projects, estimation of $250,000 or less. Or you want to look for social projects, meaning direct award without competition, or micro purchases. Micro purchases are projects ten thousand dollars or less. In, in a micro purchase, Deborah and you know some of you who sell products, if your project is less than ten thousand dollars, they can just swipe a credit card and do a purchase order, and that's it. It does not have to go through the twelve steps and the ten steps that we talked about. So this is easy. So these are, as a small business, this is what you want to do. And you want to submit proposals during the fourth quarter because this is the heaviest buying time. And so submit as many proposals as you, and that means you're going to stay up late. That means you're going to put a lot of hours during the fourth quarter. But come the first, second quarter, it, you're going to have a lot of slow time. And um, this just goes into who's spending what. DOD spent 64% uh, in 20, 2017, and 2018 is the same. Uh, Department of Energy, VA, HHS, and then the uh, CDC is the largest federal agency in the state of Georgia. And they spend about $6.2 billion. All of you should do business with CDC because yet the CDC needs logistics. Of course they do. The CDC needs training. Of course they do. The CDC needs paper and products and new doors and you know do they need catering service of course they do and so they need all of these things here 60 percent of contracts are competitively competed and then um 190 billion dollars is not competed meaning that it was sole source or there was only one company that can do the work like think about this here the military is building a missile defense system. Do, do you think they want the public to know about it? 
Do you think they want a whole bunch of company competing for that project? No, they're going to go to Lockheed Martin and say, hey, we, we got a budget for $3 billion and we want to build out this missile defense system and we need to negotiate how we're going to get this done with you. That's it. That's another type of sole source contract. They can do sole source through small business. They can do sole source for other reasons like that too. But that's not competed. So that's a lot of money that you know was not competed. So that's where you want to play. Most of, most people play here where it's competed with other companies. But this is really where you want to play, right? The other forty percent. And this is the relationship chart. But because of time, I can't go through it. Uh, you need relationship with government agencies. You need relationship with other large and small businesses, and you need to build out your government contracting team down here. Everybody needs a team. If you are a solopreneur, you're going to have a hard time in the government space, or you're going to have a hard time as an entrepreneur in general. No man, no woman is an island. You have to build team. You have to build other people. You have to trust other people to be part of your team, and trust is. Some people say, I can't trust until you earn it. I look at it as the opposite. You give trust to people and they will live up to it, but you validate it to see if they are trustworthy. If they're not, then I will say this, sir. You, cannot, you can never trust anybody 100%. Why? Huh? Yeah. We're going to fail you. We're not perfect. And so you can't, you, when you say, I trust you 100%, no, you can never say that. You always have to build trust and you always have to do your best to be trustworthy, right? Because you are prone to making mistakes. You are prone to letting money be the ultimate goal and letting greed get the best of you, right? And we're all prone for that. And so you're, you're, you're human, but you have to build trust. And so to do that, you're going to need a proposal, right? You're going to need a capture manager. You need a cost estimate. You're going to need all these different people to be part of your team. Don't hold things so close to your vest that you can't build team around you. You're going to need a team. So that's all we got for today. Any questions as we close out? Uh, for those of you joining us online, I know I didn't pause for question for you, but uh, um, any questions? Anybody here as well as those online? Uh-huh. About 90% of federal opportunity is found on FBO. There are some that's not on FBO. Um, they, the, the requirement says that they must publish for public competition. They can use the newspaper. They can use their own local website. They can use, but most of them use FBO. And, and so, you know, a few, they can just do a purchase order. There's a lot of new things that's happening. Just uh, mm -hmm. you have to market, build relationship, so that when they need something, they say, "Oh yeah, 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 I know you have that." They just pick up the phone and say, "Hey, can you can you send this me? Uh, you know, I want. Do you have a website? Can I order from, or do I need to send you a PO?" And so that's that's where you know because. It's the government, but they're still people. All right, so I want to wrap up with this last few comments here before we close out the day. So I appreciate all of you being here. Uh, but we have an upcoming program that I want to tell you about. So this is a, uh, we have our capture, our certified capture manager program. This is our last cohort. So as, as you can see, everybody had a lot of fun. Uh, it was really hard and tough and grueling and I, I put you to work. So our certified capture management program is where I work with you for 12 weeks. 
and I teach you as a CEO of your own company or as a capture, capture manager for your own company. In the gummy market, we don't call it business development. We don't call it sales. We call it capture management because it's more complex than just sales. It's more complex than just business development. And so capture management is a very serious process. Uh, and the reason why a lot of companies don't succeed is they don't understand the capture process. I've given you a look at the 12 steps that you have to go through. I've given you a quick look at 10 steps that get agencies go through. But imagine taking 12 weeks of your time and every single week we meet and you have to invest about six to 10 hours a week through this next 12 weeks. Uh, well, this starts in October, but, uh, and so you invest in yourself for your company so that you, cause you are the lead capture person for your company. If you're the CEO, you are the lead capture person. Uh, for your company. Or if you have a BD person, then you need, we need to train them to be a capture manager for your company. So this is the last cohort. We had about 14 of us. A few of them were, didn't make it to the uh, graduation picture here. But uh, so we take you through a process and uh, let me go through the details here. So capture manager is the person responsible for winning contracts for your company. So that's, that's what a capital manager is. And why should you do this, sir? It distinguishes yourself apart from everybody else. On LinkedIn, anybody is a PMP certified? Okay. Before there was the Project Management Institute, what was there? People just doing project management? It didn't exist? I've been thinking about that for so long since I <laughs> Oh, I don't know what it's called, but it's right. It slips off the top of my tongue. Oh my goodness, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. So, but, 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 but to your point, yes. PMP certifications and all that is not, it has always been around. Correct. But project management has always been around. Right. There was just not a quantification in creating best practices and standards. Right. So, capture management, government contracting has been around longer than project management. When the first shot was fired, Right, 1775, September 13th or September something. Someone says, Paul Revere wrote up that night, said the British are coming and we need volunteers, we need uniforms, we need ammunition, we need all these different, they started, because even before there was a government, there was government contracting. Yeah, it's been around all these years. So capture management has been around for a long time in the government market but it has never been quantified until GCA said, you know what, we got to create the best standards and the practices. And that's what we're trying to do here. Part of what we're trying to do here is not only teach you how to be, how to win contracts, but to create a process so that you can become a professional in the industry. And so we're creating uh, this here so that you can distinguish yourself from anybody else. So far, we've graduated 45 people through the program and, um, some of them are using it for their own company and some of them are using it to train other companies to be capture managers as employee for other companies or as consultants for other companies so it doesn't matter you know which angle it is but we teach you to be a capture manager it helps your company to win more contracts that's ultimately the bottom line and expand your knowledge about the government market um i have a a dictionary that I call um, the Governese Dictionary. And we take you through many, many of those terminologies. And so there's uh, practical and a little bit of memorization because there's some things that you just have to memorize, like FBO, right? That's not a theory, that's that's just FBO. And what does FBA, FBO stands for? Fat Biz Ops, Federal Business Opportunity. And so it's something you just have to learn and get to know. And so we take you through that, build your knowledge, and we create professional standards and conducts that as a capture manager, you're not going to lie to the government and so forth. And, and you're going to be truthful in your negotiation and so forth. And again, you gain a competitive advantage against your competitors. And it allows you to potentially, if you are a consultant or if you're working as a BD in a company, it potentially will increase your income. Because capture managers are very expensive. What, what the average salary for capture managers, 159,000. If you are in DC, it can actually be higher. 
uh, it could be 200, $250,000 in the DC market. Uh, but the average, the average is this year. It's 12 weeks and you get the gut fast track software, which is our blueprint, the 965 steps I told you about that's included in the program. And then you also get gov LMS, which is our learning management system where we actually have, we, so you get the lecture and you get the actual, uh, online training as well. And then you also get a video course. We have a, about a 13 hour, 14 hour video course as well, which is where I actually record me telling you different things and you watch it and you check out complete, complete, complete and keep on going through the process. So these two combined together is, you know, very, very solid. That is very important. Uh, and then you get a practice portal so you can practice the tests. And then we have a one day boot camp to kind of summarize all your knowledge in one day boot camp. And then you take the exam so that you can become a certified capture manager for your own company. And then you get to network with other. And so, cause you start to build all the people that went through this together, you build a friendship cause it's 12 weeks of, when I say it's really intense, you, you, you have to invest six, a minimum of six to 10 hours a week. Some weeks may be a little higher, but some weeks will be like two, three hours. But so there's the class time, there's the group study time, and there's the homework time to get it done. And so it's like nothing like anything out there. It, this does not exist in the government market. We create it here uh, so that you can actually get to where you want to go. The program is $5,000. And we do have payment plans for some, you know, small business that say, hey, you know, I want to get into this program but I just don't have the full budget. And so we have a few options in terms of how we can work with you also. And then for, uh, if you demonstrate a real need and you really, really don't have the fund, we do have partial scholarships also where um, we can work that out. So if you're interested in the program, our goal is to really create uh, the standards, just like the Project Management Institute uh, cre mm -hmm. uh, created a whole industry there's probably about close to a million PMP uh, out there now before nobody was certified. Capture managers, when I, when I go to LinkedIn and I put the word, the title, capture managers, there's actually about 730,000 people with that term capture manager as their professional industry. But there's no professional designation for it. And so that's what we're trying to do. So, when you enroll in this, you actually get a jump ahead of everybody else. Eventually, the, the SBA and the government is going to say, hey, are you a certified capture manager? And they're going to start referring people to this there. So companies that get a head start kind of get the edge. And to enroll, you go to capturemanagementinstitute.com. And that is a um, subset of GCA. Eventually, we're probably going to spin it off as its own company but GCA is actually incubating the Capture Management Institute, CMI, until it can stand up on its own. So any questions about anything today in the uh, Capture Management Program? Anyone interested to be a certified Capture Manager? Okay, awesome. So I have more information, so if you um, shoot me an email, I can send you more information. Sure. Hi, well, hey, I enjoy having everybody here. I know we went a little bit long, but uh, thanks for sticking around and hanging out with me today. Next week, right back here, 1030, we have another class. Uh, I think the class is going to be on, if I remember, I think it's around relationships. So we go into more details there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mine. Appreciate okay. it. Awesome. Yeah. All right. That was great. So we'll see you. And then um, next step, become a member. Yeah. And then open up the doors to all the things. And then we have a new member orientation. <coughs> and so when you come to the new member orientation, um, we will tell you all the benefits that you get okay. and all the different programs that we have, setting you up on gov directions and all the other different things that we have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, good meeting, Chris. Yeah. Pam, you need me? Yeah, okay. I hope you still on there. Not sure, but so questions online. Let's see here. Yep, I went back to the. All right. So our. Please email. Okay. So um, Alex, if you're still on, uh, you can download this presentation here. So go to govassociation.org forward slash download, and you can download today's presentation there. That way you have all the slides. Did you catch that? Alex, did you catch that? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Okay, awesome. I was yes, trying so to write it down, but you got off it too quick. Yeah. Gov Association. Uh, dot org forward slash download and you can download today's presentation there i had another question for you if you don't mind yeah go ahead um you talked about the um education fiscal year ending in june but mm -hmm. you also said in in a lot of cases fourth quarter is when organizations spend the bulk of their budgetary dollars yeah. and so when's the best time to kind of grab a hold of that from the ed market the the sled because that's when their school year is ending yes and so, so they're the, kind of shutting it down so i wanted to know if there were different rules that applied to them yeah so at the the sled market is um uh may april may and june that's when they're going to spend, spend the, the most of money yep okay that's the best time to uh sell to them now, what okay. types of services do you have, Alex? We do supply chain management, so pretty much everything. We focus a lot on electronics, but we can get them anything. Uh, we, what we like to tell our clients is, if we can't get it, you really don't need it. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, so uh, do you already have a GSA schedule? We are not on a GSA schedule. Now, there is a new new uh if, since you do uh, logistics and supply uh there is a new web tool out there that you want to definitely pay attention to because it's going to be very critical for what you do uh, gsa e-commerce they're putting out a new e-commerce portal so think of it as amazon uh gsa gsa advantage Nope, nope. It's a it's a new version of GSA Advantage, not GSA okay. Advantage. Gov. They are building a e-commerce portal similar to Amazon. In fact, I think they're in the pilot program that they're launching uh, this fall. They Amazon is actually one of the pilot um, participants. So they're trying to make it more off the shelf. Okay. Uh, so. And but when they're testing, they're in the pilot. They're only going to test pro, uh, product uh, less than ten thousand dollars. Okay. But pay attention. Go read up on GSA e-commerce. Will do. And uh, read up all about it. Pre uh, prepare your business for that there, because that's going to be critical. Great. Thank you kindly. Great class today. All right. Hey, are you local here in Atlanta, or are you out of state? We're out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, okay. I'm awesome. actually in the DC area though. I, I work remotely. Okay, cool. Well, you're on contract capital of the world there. Yeah. How long you been doing government work? Actually, um, just for the last year, I was private sector all my life. And um, my, my best friend for of 40 years started a service disabled veteran owned company. And I came on board because I think we have the ability to build something special and kind of get on the other side of money, if you will. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, hey, uh, you could consider joining our capture management program. I was looking at that. Yeah. I, was, um, I think that's awesome. So um, our, our owner, Keith and I will have to have a discussion about that. I was actually wondering if it's something that he might want to do. 
since he's the leader of the organization, but we'll have that discussion. Sure. Um, yeah, shoot, shoot me an email um, and then I can send you the whole write up on it. So to okay. have a uh, more informed conversation with him. Okay, will do. All right. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for your time. Have a great day. All right. Take care. Bye.